Saunas is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Saunas and Dr. Ed Feng. Welcome everybody into Covering the Spread here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonnes. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire, joined here by Ed Fang of the PowerRank.com. Ed, it's college football week. Here on Covering the Spread, we're talking Heisman betting later with Edward Egross, and we're going to talk with you about your college football numbers later on. So I'm pumped. I'm feeling the fall rushing through my veins. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm pumped to call, uh, talk about college football. I feel like uh, sometimes, you know, it, it it falls a little bit behind the NFL in terms of coverage. And so I'm glad we're giving it its due. Uh, I've tried to give some uh, college football points in the, in the past couple of shows. And so mm-hmm. I'm just excited to talk about it. Yeah, for me, I feel like college football is more of a release because a lot of my like day-to-day work during the fall revolves around the NFL. Okay. Whereas like college, I can just kind of enjoy it a bit more. Sure. And... I, I think that because of that, I tend to romanticize it a bit more than I do football. And I, I agree that it's probably not as universal as it probably should be. Because, like, waking up on a Saturday morning, turning on a college football game, and yep. just doing nothing for a day is honestly one of the most appealing activities in the entire world to me. Well, and hopefully we won't make your Saturday too stressful by putting too many bets down. But right? we'll see what <laughs> happens when we get there in September. Hopefully the process is good enough. We don't have to sweat it too much. And we can uh, just sit back and relax. Again, follow Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank. I am at Jim Sonis. And big thank you to everyone who left a rating and review on the podcast last week. Uh, great response by all of you. Still plenty of time to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. Again, it, it does help us a ton. We get those ratings and reviews up on Apple Podcasts. So please go to Apple Podcasts. Search for Covering the Spread. Leave a review if you like what Edward says later on today. Or if you listen to Evan Silva last week or Whale Capper, what they thought, leave a review, rate the podcast. That does help us out so, so, so much. As mentioned, Evan Silva was on with us last week to talk NFL win totals, why he likes the Ravens this year. Check that out. Uh, And some other thoughts on 2019. We also talked to Whale Capper about NBA championship futures. You can find all those by going to Covering the Spread on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, and Stitcher, and subscribe to get each podcast as it is posted. As mentioned later today, Edward Egros coming up, but on Thursday, we'll talk with Ed about his college football numbers to see what they say for 2019. And we got a little taste of the, the college football numbers. So I'm pretty excited to dig in a little bit more with you and talk about you know some various conferences of, of note for 2019. Maybe we'll get some, uh, some Stanford and some Northwestern talk in there as well. Sounds good. And uh, coming up to date, in just one second here on Covering This Present, we're going to talk with Edward Egros about Heisman voting. Follow Ed on Twitter, at Ed with Sports. Edward appears on TVG's More Ways to Win, part of uh, FanDuel as well. You can also find him at Fox Sports Southwest. He is the host of the Rangers Deep Cuts podcast. That's on Volca Media and has a Cowboys podcast coming up just around the corner at that same spot. So if you follow Ed on, Edward on Twitter, at Ed with Sports, you can find find all that and the reason why I'm on talk analytics is because he is an adjunct professor at Southern Methodist University teaches a class on sports analytics there so who better to teach us about uh, sports analytics and what they mean for Heisman betting that's coming up in just one second here's Edward Egros of Fox Sports Southwest covering the present Let's welcome to the show Edward Egros. And Edward, I actually met you at the Sloan Analytics Conference a couple of years ago. And at that same conference is where I met Ed Fang. So kind of a little bit of a reunion here of the people who have met at some point at the Sloan Analytics Conference. So uh, Edward, welcome to Covering the Spread. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well, doing very well. Uh, we, We all need to get back to Boston at some point soon, don't we? Absolutely. I would be 100% down to do that. And hopefully we could talk some sports betting while we're there too. Now that that's uh, spreading the globe and definitely gaining some traction. I think that it would definitely apply to a lot of the analytics conversations out there. Have you been to Sloan the past couple of years and has sports betting been part of the conversation at Sloan when you've been there? You know, I haven't been the last couple of years uh, and that's sort of in large part because I've been going to other conferences, uh, whether it's uh, the New England uh, Sports Conference uh, up at Harvard, uh, whether it's been Minneapolis up in Minneapolis uh, when uh, Minneapolis hosted uh, Super Bowl 52. Uh, I've tried to get some things uh, going closer to Texas. And sports betting really hasn't been discussed too much. 
uh, it's sort of been on the ancillary, but it's it's funny. Like if there's one thing that say analytics sports and conventional sports have in common is that sports betting has always been part of the conversation, but it's always been sort of on the outskirts. And I think only recently uh, have things sort of been brought into the fold. And uh, that, that's exciting in so many ways, because I think it carries the conversation forward in ways uh, that we otherwise haven't been able to. And it's yeah. definitely applicable, too. Yeah, mm-hmm. I've, I've been at Sloan the last couple of years, and the actual sports betting conference is not particularly enlightening. But when you guys show up next year, uh, we'll go out to <laughs> Degenerates, and you'll get plenty of information there, and, uh, and we can go from there. Awesome. I'm looking forward to that for sure. Now, Edward, we're talking about Heisman betting for today. You've been talking plenty of college football and more ways to win on TVG. So we got to get your thoughts here on some college football stuff for 2019, specifically focusing on the Heisman. And I think that it's best to start here from a philosophical perspective. When you look at Heisman betting in general, based on your process, is it better to go with the favorites, you know, like Trevor Lawrence and Tua Tunga Vailoa for this year, or or should we bank on long shots in general to win the Heisman? I prefer going after long shots uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, number one, favorites in the preseason almost never win. I'm looking at Heisman winners right now uh, dating back to 2009, and the only one who was a preseason favorite who won was Marcus Mariota. Uh, he was at plus 425 a few years back. He was a three-star recruit and really blossomed at Oregon. Uh, but for the most part, these guys – you know, they weren't that highly ranked in the preseason. Baker Mayfield was third highest. Uh, other than that, you've got a lot of guys who were 11th, 13th. A lot of them weren't even on uh, preseason rankings. Uh, you couldn't bet on them at all. And even when their number did come up, say, in week three, week four, uh, they were still a long shot. And so to me, you have this sort of uh, dangerous situation when it comes to preseason Heisman odds where perhaps a favorite isn't even listed at this point. And those who are listed, yeah, you have two favorites at this point. But there are so many things that can happen. Uh, and I think there's also this element of surprise where I think a lot of Heisman voters like somebody who has, quote unquote, come out of nowhere uh, to win the whole thing. Right. So, Edward, so what's the general archetype of player that tends to win the Heisman in terms of position, conference, team strength, winning? What's, what's the general type of player? Absolutely. So when it comes to position, uh, over the years, uh, 41 running backs have won, 35 quarterbacks have won, and then you have eight others. So you pretty much have to be a running back or a quarterback uh, to win this award. And even the others, uh, and some who almost became one of the others, like uh, Tyron Matthew, the honey badger at LSU, he was returning punts as well. So you almost have to have a a job diversification if you're not going to be a quarterback or running back to really have a legitimate shot of winning the Heisman. Uh, but not since 1997 as a quarterback or running back won the award. Uh, 40 different schools have won. 18 have multiple awards. One of the things about college football that is probably why the sport does so well, but also why it can be a little bit frustrating, is because it's pretty much the same programs that win the national championship, go to the playoff, and then also win the Heisman as well. You really don't see too many schools sort of come out of nowhere to capture the Heisman Trophy or capture a playoff spot. Certainly there are exceptions to that. Robert Griffin III out of Baylor. Uh, certainly Baylor's uh, you know, not known necessarily for producing great quarterbacks, but this one instance they did. Uh, I look at it as uh, a situation where you're looking for tradition, you're looking for those big names, but then also, too, sometimes you're looking for schools that produce uh, certain types of players, and sometimes those players get highly recognized. So, for instance, uh, Wisconsin is known as a running back U, and so their running backs tend to do very well when it comes to Heisman votes. Uh, Alabama has two Heisman winners. Both of them are running backs. Texas has produced some running backs uh, that have won Heismans. Uh, Other programs like Oklahoma, Ohio State, they tend to be quarterbacks. And so I think you have the combination of tradition, but then also the position that that school normally produces and is successful with. I think those things are important, too. So certainly we have like an archetype here. You know, we want players at impactful positions on impactful programs, but there are some guys who have semi-short odds for this year who may not necessarily fit that archetype. You know, they may not be from the biggest schools. They may not be from a Power 5 conference even. How willing are you to bet someone who doesn't fit into those buckets you just discussed? For this year, I am very, very willing to 
bet on uh, something that doesn't belong in these buckets. And one guy in particular who I think fits this absolutely perfectly is uh, Derek King, the quarterback yes. at Houston. He finished fourth in total QBR, seventh in passing efficiency last season. Now, George's Jake Fromm slightly ahead of him, uh, but King now has Dana Holgerson as his head coach, and he helped Will Greer develop at West Virginia. So I think there's actually more room for growth for King, and especially given Fromm is at plus 2,000, King at plus 3,000. Uh, somebody in a non-Power 5 conference. And granted, Houston has won the Heisman Trophy before, but that was back before you know all of us were born, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, but regardless, <laughs> still, it's, it's something where, yeah, you have somebody who is capable of being groomed, being developed even more than he already has. He's got a new head coach who has done well with quarterbacks in the past. Derek King makes a lot of sense to me as somebody who could come out of nowhere and seize this whole thing. Well, I think the one thing working in his favor, too, is that there will be attention on that program because <laughs> Dana Holgerson is there, as you mentioned, and that's a positive for him from a notoriety perspective. But also, he was really good last year. You look at his passing numbers. Ignore the rushing. And the rushing is stupid. You know, the numbers <laughs> he put up as a rusher. The passing was really good from an efficiency perspective, too. And that's why I think that Derrick King is is super intriguing. And if it weren't for that knee injury last year, maybe we'd be even more into him for this year. Is he kind of the first guy who stands out to you as being someone who is an attractive bet? He's plus, uh, he's 30-1 to right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. And I was going to ask you about him, honestly, so I'm glad you brought him up. Uh, but is he kind of the first guy who stands out to you? Great minds think alike. This is the, the <laughs> last of the podcast episode. Great it's minds. All about, it's all about college football DFS because he is a god there. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and one thing I would add, too, is uh, if he does become a finalist, I do believe Tom Herman should get an invitation uh, to sit close yeah. to the front of the room. And that's in large part because of exactly what you just talked about. We know about the Houston football program, whereas there are a lot of other you know, American conference programs that we don't know that much about. And because of what Tom Herman was able to do to get Houston on the map, Dana Holgerson should be able to carry that forward. It might take a little bit. Who knows? But I think because we know about that program now, there is the potential for notoriety. And you absolutely have to have that to be in Heisman consideration. Edward, I wanted to ask you about another player with some longer odds. Uh, Jalen Hurts, he's transferring over to Oklahoma, and I don't like him as a Heisman candidate because he's going to Oklahoma, where the last two uh, Heisman winners have come from at the quarterback position. I like him because I think he's a pretty good quarterback, and I think he can throw the ball pretty well. Um, Alabama, last year he started full-time, was 15th when I looked at yards per play adjusted for strength of schedule. I think this guy can just play flat-out play football. Where do you stand on Jalen Hurts? Well, I think this makes sense that uh, certainly it feels odd to go back to the same school in the same position uh, three straight years. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, I like Jalen Hurts as a quarterback. Uh, I, I do find it interesting that he's coming from Nick Saban's program and he was able to develop uh, quite well there. But is Lincoln Riley that much better of a quarterback whisperer than the guys uh, Alabama has had over these last few years? That That's sort of a, a concern of mine because – I, not that Alabama does everything perfectly, but certainly they do a lot of things very, very well. And so does Lincoln Riley have what it takes to develop somebody even more and take them to that next level? I think that's a very important question to ask. The other thing, too, about Oklahoma that I don't think we're talking about enough is that I think the Big 12 is going to be a good bit tougher this year, maybe a, a little bit more top heavy than, say, the last few years. Uh, I like Iowa State a ton. Uh, Texas uh, may very well be back. I have some concerns about them, but... That is a serious uh, contender in the Big 12. I think TCU deserves more recognition than what it's getting in the preseason. So I think the schedule gets a good bit tougher for Oklahoma. I think there are going to be more challenges for Jalen Hurts than, say, what Kyler Murray and Baker Mayfield faced. And so because of all of those things, I'm certainly a little bit more bearish about uh, Hurts' chances to win the Heisman uh, than certainly the last couple of Oklahoma quarterbacks. Yeah, and, and I'd like to just yeah. jump in real quick. Like, I mean, the one thing, like, they've had an excellent offensive line the past two years. So I know Jim's big into studying the offensive <laughs> line. Um, I, I'm really interested in losing that many starters off a great line, how that's going to affect that offense as well. Completely. So, again, just another one of the challenges that Hurts will face. Completely agree with you. And let's we'll circle back to Trevor Lawrence and Tua Tagovailoa in a second. But you mentioned Iowa State, and you sounded pretty excited about them. So any thoughts on Brock Purdy, who is not currently listed uh, at FanDuel Sportsbook, if he were to become listed, Edward, 
Would he pique your interest at all? Absolutely, he would pique my interest. All right. And a slight digression here from uh, your question. It is fascinating, again, going back to Heisman odds, that some who have won were not listed in the preseason. And th this is the danger of going into, you know, trying to pick somebody because the name may simply not be there. It, it very much is an award where somebody can come out of nowhere to a point uh, and win this whole thing. Brock Purdy at Iowa State, sixth in passer rating, 21st in total QBR, gets another year of development. And I think Iowa State could very well finish second or first in the Big 12. And if they're able to seize headlines by beating big old Oklahoma in glorious fashion, how the heck is he not part of the hot conversation? Something else, too, I wanted to add is uh, any and every Heisman winner over the last several years, they've come in as, as at least a three-star recruit. Uh, it's it's something where, OK, you can't be a two star or one star come literally out of nowhere and win this thing. You at least to have you, you need to have at least a little bit of preseason pub to you. Uh, Brock Purdy is a three star. A lot of other big names were three stars as well. Certainly a couple of five stars like Kyler Murray do win the award. Uh, but if you have at least three stars to your name, then that's certainly a qualification. And Purdy certainly has that. Couple things about Bro uh, Brock Purdy too. He has a brother named Chuba. I think that's a positive, just because it sounds cool. Uh, so that's a huge pl uh, plus for Brock Purdy. Also, with Akeem Butler leaving and being a, I believe, he's a fourth round pick in the NFL. Clearly, NFL talent ev evaluators are not as high on Hakeem Butler as some of us uh, may have been entering the NFL draft, which means it may not be as big of a loss as it may be perceived to be. So Brock Purdy, interesting guy if you do see his name pop up on some odds lists. Let's talk here about the guys at the top end right now, Edward. We're talking here with Edward Egros. Follow him on Twitter, at EdWithSports. And Edward, we have Tua Tunga Vailoa. He is plus 350. We have Trevor Lawrence at plus 200. You can bet on them versus the field at FanDuel Sportsbook. Sounds like we're taking the field pretty easily here. But let's say I forced you to choose between Tua and between Trevor at their respective odds, which one do you like more between those two guys? Well, first off, Jim, I, it's not very nice of you to, to force me to pick one or the other. Right. I don't know what <laughs> I did or why I deserve this. But yep. <laughs> uh, actually, I, I may go against the grain here, and I'm, I'm going to go with Tua uh, over Trevor for a couple of reasons. Um, I think, not psychologically perhaps, but... Uh, I think a lot of people looked at Trevor, uh, you know, coming in midseason and all of a sudden winning the national championship as somebody who, uh, again, it's that coming out of nowhere narrative. And if he has a full season and a full off season as the starter, then he can really show what he's capable of. Well, you look at the numbers, though. Uh, Lawrence had more pass attempts than Tua for the season, uh, more plays overall. Lawrence actually played more than Tua Tagovailoa, and that's in large part because Alabama was beating up on everybody by 30, 40 points. And then they were able to go to Hertz in the, the third and fourth quarters. Uh, but you get down even deeper here uh, to a 199.4 passing efficiency. Uh, you know, that's at the top of the list. Uh, Trevor Lawrence was 12th in that department. Uh, total QBR Tua was second uh, among all college football quarterbacks. Trevor was eighth. And so Tua, he played less and still put up better efficiency numbers and I don't see why that wouldn't continue next season. Edward, so there's a, there's kind of a second tier behind these these two top leaders. Um, you have a guy who has not started a college football game yet, and Justin Fields has the third highest odds, and then a bunch of guys in the, the 20 to, to 30 level. Um, besides the guys you've already talked about, anyone – well, actually, does, does the Justin Fields thing uh, kind of stand out to you, being the third highest? Sure. Uh, it, it is interesting. Uh, but at the same time, I think, uh, you know, the college football narrative these days involves basically only five football programs. When you think about it, <laughs> we talk about Alabama a lot. We talk about Clemson. We talk about Georgia now because uh, they made the national championship game and the only one to, to really fight with Alabama within conference. Uh, we talk about Ohio State a good bit. and We talk about Oklahoma. And it seems like those are the only five programs that that get national attention. And so those key marquee players uh, from those five programs are certainly going to get good Heisman odds. Um, and plus, it's like, OK, Ohio State's been knocking on the door to get into the playoff. It hadn't happened. And so at, at some point, this has to. Right. So I think that's sort of part of the narrative. Um, but, but as far as uh, anybody else who I think uh, has a great shot at winning the Heisman, uh, one guy I'm very much interested in is uh, Khalil Tate. 
uh, second in total QBR in 2017. And he has a coach who groomed a Heisman Trophy winner before. Tate suffered, you know, that sort of ankle injury in 2018. Could bounce back and surprise some people. And at plus 3,000, I think that's good value. Absolutely. And I think that he has a name recognition too, which is always in his favor because he got a lot of buzz last year. So that's interesting. Let's go a little bit deeper. We did mention Brock Purdy, who is not currently on the board. I don't know how much deeper you can go than that, but (laughs) anybody longer you want to throw out here, Edward, while we're on the air? Anybody longer? Uh, That is a good question. If there's not, that is totally okay too. Well, I mean, looking at the other names of... Jeez, uh, at, you know, at plus 6,000, maybe uh, JT Daniels uh, makes some sense there. Uh, Kellen Mond, uh, plus 15,000. I mean, you know, to me, Texas A&M could be the only program in the West that could really uh, go toe to toe with Alabama. Uh, you know, I know LSU gets a lot of recognition and, and deservedly so, but I, I think A&M can finish second in the SEC West. And with that, you certainly have the possibility of upsetting Alabama. And if that happens, you're going to get some Heisman consideration. Uh, but it is basically one game against uh, quite possibly the best program in college football. So maybe that one makes some sense. But there's so many names that are not listed that I actually like a good bit uh, just in the terms of the variability uh, index, as it were. Uh, so, you know, the ones listed, uh, nobody really stands out aside, aside from the ones I've mentioned before. But goodness gracious, you don't have to wait uh, too long for uh, somebody to come out of nowhere. And probably that that first name, that second name that jumps into the list, uh, I will be looking at very seriously. So what are the names that you're monitoring uh, as guys who may not be listed right now? Again, we mentioned Brock Purdy, but you said there were a couple other guys. Is there anyone else that, you know, that you're at least monitoring for right now? Absolutely. Uh, so I mentioned uh, the programs that get national attention. Uh, obviously, Alabama is one of them. Uh, Trey Sanders, the running back, uh, you know, very young, uh, but as as I'm sure you guys agree, uh, running backs, they can be young and still be very, very effective. Uh, this is a five-star guy, uh, one of the top recruits in the country. And this may be somebody who has to you know, carry the load a bit more, depending upon how Alabama uses Tua. They may want to sort of save him a good bit and make sure he's not doing very much work. Uh, but with so, many, so much talent uh, on the offensive side of the ball for Alabama, Certainly a running back could, could come in there and be incredibly effective, saving Tua uh, from having to extend himself too much. Uh, so that's somebody who uh, you know makes a lot of sense. Also, uh, just down the road from there at Auburn, you have a quarterback battle between Bo Nix and Joey Gatewood. Uh, Auburn is usually pretty reliable when it comes to getting at least seven to eight to nine wins. And who knows? They may break through at some point. if they, they, They've had success against Alabama the last few years. Uh, you know, not a ton, but they have gotten a couple of upsets here and there. Uh, and so certainly the quarterback at Auburn, if they're able to, to piece something together, that's something to watch out for. So it's, it's one of those situations where I think you want to look for guys who have opportunities to be in the national spotlight and have a good supporting cast around them to possibly pull off a major upset. Maybe they're not in the playoff. Maybe they're not, they're not winning a conference championship. But they, if you have that sort of Heisman moment or that Heisman highlight reel that's just a little bit better than everyone else's, that certainly matters. Doesn't yeah. get a whole lot better than unlisted. I like it. Mm-hmm. Unlisted, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I really love the logic with Auburn. I mean, their program history is so volatile in terms mm-hmm. of you know coming close to winning a national championship and – uh, Gus Malzahn's first year and then kind of falling off and, you know, coming close again. So just a, always a program where the cupboard is stacked. So love the logic on that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That is all we have for today with Edward Egros. Edward, I want to thank you for hopping on here, spreading some knowledge, uh, giving me some solid confirmation bias on uh, Derek King and Brock <laughs> Purdy. Uh, I appreciate that all by itself. So thank you for making me feel better about my college football takes. I appreciate that. And hopefully we can get you on the air again soon to talk more college football. Anytime you want me on, I am available to build the echo chamber for you. (laughs) Thank you so much. We'll talk to you again soon. My pleasure. Thank you. Covering the future. One final thank you to Edward E. Gross for hopping on here and chatting with us about Heisman odds. Really fun discussion uh, and talking about a lot of it, it players who should be really exciting to watch for 2019. Make sure you keep an eye out for those guys he mentioned, too, who are not listed yet in case they become listed after week one. Follow Edward on Twitter 
at Ed with Sports. If you want to get in on the action and check out those odds, check out the FanDuel Sportsbook and place your first bet today. If you lose, FanDuel will give you a refund of up to $500 in site credit. Visit sportsbook.fanduel.com for more details. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 plus and physically present in New Jersey or Pennsylvania because Pennsylvania has just launched for FanDuel Sportsbook. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Let's finish up here with covering the future for this week in Ed. Last week, we talked about NFL futures, and one of the teams I neglected to discuss during that discussion was the Colts, and I think that they're a team that's gotten a lot of, you know, a lot of enthusiasm from people like me and other people, you know, who look at analytics because of how good their offense was last year. You want to talk about the Colts for covering the future, but from a different perspective and focusing on a potential weak spot within that team. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think this is a team that uh, I, I agree with all the optimism about the offense uh, in terms of the play calling. I, I, we talked about it with uh, Evan Silva as well, just, you know, the, the, the modern things that this team is doing. But let's look at the defensive side of the ball. And the, the way I'm evaluating their defense in 2018 is by success rate. And it's a pretty simple definition. Uh, play is success for an offense if they get half of the yards on first down, 70% of the yards on second down, and then all the necessary yards on third and fourth down. Now, when you take that metric and look at success rate allowed for the Colts, uh, they were 25th when you look at the raw numbers. Unfortunately, the story gets even worse when you make adjustments for strength of schedule. Uh, that's what I'm good at, and you have to look at who they played last year. So in division, you're looking at Houston, um, Tennessee, and Jacksonville. None of those teams really had great offenses by the adjusted success rate calculation I've done. The best unit was Tennessee at 18th. So in division, you're looking at three teams that had below NFL average offenses. And then when you look, um, you know, the scheduling gods were very kind to the Colts last year. They had to play the AFC East. Obviously, that includes a very tough game against New England, whose offense is terrific. And that was by far the best offense that they played last year. But you also get the Buffalo Bills, you get the Miami Dolphins, and you get the New York Jets from last year. Those were three of the bottom six offenses by adjusted success rate. So when you do the adjustment for opponent with success rate, the Colts dropped to 31st. Okay, Ooh. So this unit um, has, was not good last year. They're kind of relying on a lot of the same guys uh, to come back. And, um, you know, when you're 31st in the NFL, you're going to get better simply by rushing the mean. But how much better are they going to get? Uh, I have my doubts about that. And then let's look at the schedule that the Colts have this year. I mean, it's a complete uh, different story than last year. So instead of the AFC East, you're getting the AFC West. This includes two road games at the Los Angeles Chargers and at the Kansas City Chiefs. We both know those two teams have fantastic offenses. Um, they also play the NFC South. So, again, you're facing great offenses, Atlanta and Matt Ryan, uh, New Orleans and Drew Brees, and Tampa Bay's not going to be a very good football team probably, but they were pretty good on offense last year, um, and they'll, they'll have Jameis Winston again this year. So the schedule flips. I mean, the defense needs to be better for this team to be a legit Super Bowl contender. Um I haven't talked myself quite into it, but I'm thinking mm. about Colts under nine and a half wins. My general philosophy with NFL win totals is you want to go under those high numbers. You want to go over the low numbers. Regression to the mean is a stark reality in the NFL. Um, and right now, you know, it's, you know, you're shading uh, at, at when I checked the uh, FanDuel Sportsbook, it was plus 25 on under nine and a half wins for the Colts. Um, you know, this team is all about like, you know, how high can the offense go? Uh, you know, how much will that defense hold them back? Um, but uh, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I haven't taught myself into it, but I'm thinking about the under right. on the Colts nine and a half. And, and I, I think, think that, this is a kind of contrarian play because I think a lot of yeah. people are very excited about where this Colts team is headed. Well, on your podcast just last week, uh, we were talking about how much I love the Colts offensive line, and that's led me to be pretty excited about this team in general. And I think that I, I like the Colts, but I think that your point about the schedule is pretty interesting because 
Let's look back to last year. After their bye week, uh, they had their bye in week nine, so they had half their week or half their season after the bye week. They faced Jacksonville. Starting quarterback there was Blake Bortles. The -hmm. next week, they faced Tennessee, and Mariota started that game but left at halftime because he got sacked and couldn't feel his hand again. So they got half of a, a game of football against Blaine Gabbert. Next week, they faced Ryan Tannehill. Then it was Cody Kessler leading a 6 nothing victory over the Colts in Jacksonville the following week. And the Cody Kessler truther in me rejoiced. The Colts backer in me did not. Uh, so that was fun. Uh, there they faced Deshaun Watson, Dak Prescott, Eli Manning. And then in Week 17, it was that, that game that could have sent Tennessee to the playoffs. Remember, Mariota couldn't play that game either. It was Blaine Gabbert again. So they right. faced Blaine Gabbert for a game and a half. They faced Cody Kessler for a full game. They faced Blake, or Blake Bortles for a good chunk of a game. I think that that backs up your concerns around their defense. And I did make some additions in free agency to that defense, but yes. I think that it's at least worthwhile to keep in mind that there is potentially more fragility within this Colts team than, than maybe I and others want to give them credit for. Yeah, and you should. we should definitely talk about the additions. I mean, Justin Houston, uh, defensive end, pass rusher, uh, they signed him in free agency. He also is 30 years old. Um, did have nine sacks, you know, each about nine sacks each of the last two years. Well, but, the Chiefs you know, felt that it was necessary to, you know, let Houston walk and trade and, and you know, make the, the trade for Frank Clark. Like, right. when a team makes that calculation, it doesn't say that that player is not good, but it mm-hmm. does at least tell you something about their evaluation of him. Right. I mean, it all depends on how much you're paying him as well. So, I mean, definitely a lot of factors that go in there. I think even as bullish as you can be, and I, you know, I agree with all the stuff that you that you've said about their offensive line. Yeah. Um, and we should make the note that you know you thought you were bullish on their offensive line heading into last year, at 22nd in your offensive line rankings, and then yeah. they got really good adding two rookies to that offensive line. Right. So exactly. on the defensive side of the ball, you know, maybe their second round pick, Rock Yashin, the cornerback out of Temple, becomes a stud. And all of a sudden you've got some questions answered on the defensive side of the ball. So these things can always happen. Right. Um, it should also be noted that, uh, you know, success in the draft tends to regress pretty hard uh, year to year for, for teams. So, yeah. well, we, I mean, we'll see how it goes. That's it's going to make it exciting. But I just think there's a lot. For me, there's a lot of concerns on the defensive side of the ball for the Colts. And the AFC South in general should be tougher this year, too, with hopefully two functioning hands for Marcus Mariota, a functioning right. quarterback in Nick Foles in Jacksonville, and Deshaun Watson maybe not getting sacked 67 times or whatever it was. Right. I want to talk here about the Minnesota Twins because I think as someone who is heavily a part of Twins Twitter uh, and follows that very closely, there's a lot of panic in Minnesota land, and there's a lot of panic in the betting right now because the Twins are currently minus 230 to make the playoffs, and they've lost lost a lot of ground to Cleveland recently. They, at one point, had an 11-game lead in the American League Central, but now, after Sunday, that lead is down to two games. It was, at one point, one game over the weekend, and that's pushed the Twins' odds to win the Central down to minus 230, which is an implied probability of 69.7%, which is still kind of high, but it's not that high. And I think that there's still some value in that line where it currently sits. The two reasons that the teams have merged back together are, first, the Cleveland offense playing really well. Jose Ramirez had an injury to start the year and has been heating up since the start of June. So let's kind of ignore for Cleveland what happened before June because I think that with Lindor being out and Ramirez not playing well, they're a different team then than they they are now. From June 1st on, Cleveland's offense ranks 6th in the league in WRC+. So they've been very good and much better than they were before. But the Twins' offense is still fourth in WRC Plus since June 1st, and that is when you lop off the really impressive start to the year that the Twins had. The other reason that the two teams have really come together is the Twins had their injuries recently, whereas Cleveland had theirs back in April. Byron Buxton missed a lot of time, and he is a big piece for the Twins. I joke about him on Twitter because I have a weird man crush on him, but he's actually a really valuable piece of this team. He ranks third in Fangraph's win above, wins above replacement among position players, and outfield wins are the dumbest stat you could possibly cite. But I think they do illustrate a lot of Buxton's value because this team is 51-24 and 24 when Buxton starts. 
They're 13 and 17 when he does not. The defensive value that Byron Buxton brings to this team is really hard to replace. Eddie Rosario missed time in that span. Those are big losses to have for this team. Miguel Sano changed up his swing recently. He's cut his strikeout rate 10 percentage points over the past month. So a lot of things right now are working in the Twins' favor, with Buxton being healthy, Rosario being healthy, Sano improving. And I think that it's a, it's a good thing for this Twins team that the odds have come down. They still rank second in the American League in run differential right now. They rank third in number fires power rankings, while Cleveland, while still very good, is down in sixth. That's why number, number fires algorithms give the Twins 81.9% odds of winning that American League Central. And again, the implied probability here based on the odds is 69.7%. So there actually is some value in betting the Twins to win the American League Central. And you should probably do it pretty soon if you want to bet the Twins because they're facing the Marlins and the Royals this week. And those two teams are not great, Bob, whereas Cleveland, I believe, is facing the Yankees. So if you want to bet the Twins, now is your time to do so. I would not panic if you are uh, someone who backed the Twins previously. Things could get better, and I think that uh, regression in the positive sense could be here for Minnesota. I, I know you focus on cluster luck a lot. Uh, yeah. Any interesting things in the Twins when it comes to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first of all, in baseball, you said you'd, uh, I mean, you'd, uh, you know, the, the season's so long, teams yeah. are going to go in ups and downs, like you, you can't overreact to things. And I think your, your thinking is right along the right lines in, in terms of not overreacting. So cluster luck is this concept that, um, you know, teams, given your underlying statistics in terms of singles, doubles, walks, homers, uh, you should score a certain number of runs. Um, and if you score over that number of runs, it's probably because you clustered your hits together, you know. So, for example, like getting nine singles in an inning instead of spreading out nine singles over nine innings. Um, so this is just and, – and the research has shown that, you know, your luck, you know, tends to regress very strongly to the mean both in season and, and between seasons. So what I, what I do for my baseball numbers is I look at the expected number of runs in terms of those underlying metrics – and so that, in some sense, accounts for cluster luck because I'm not looking at actual runs. I'm looking at expected runs. Mm -hmm. um, a bunch of other factors go into uh, my baseball numbers as well. But since, you know, May, I've been pretty surprised to see Minnesota in the top five. Um, they continue to be in the top five, just as in the number fire rankings. They're fourth right now, and they're like, you know, uh, six thousandths of a, of, of a percent of, of a run behind Tampa Bay right now. So, okay. um, you know, the Dodgers, are the top team, Dodgers and Houston are, are kind of significantly away from everyone else. But Minnesota is definitely in the conversation right behind them uh, with yeah. another surprise Tampa Bay team. Uh, Cleveland's 14th in my numbers. Okay. So a little bit uh, lower than, than you guys have over at number fire. So the numbers certainly support what you're saying. I think my numbers support what you're saying even more with, with yeah. Cleveland uh, being lower. Um, I'm not an expert on baseball handicapping or, or player situations, so I'll leave that to you, Jim. But but my <laughs> overall team numbers over the course of the year certainly agree with what you're saying. Yeah, and there's a reason I didn't say bet the Twins to win the World Series, because I would agree <laughs> that Houston and Los Angeles are like a tier above yep. everybody else, especially yep. with that rotation that Houston has. It's just stupid how good uh, yep. they are. So I'm not betting the Twins to win the World Series. That has not happened since I was six months old, so it's probably not going to happen this year either. Uh, but I think that to make the playoffs right now, there is some value in that line at minus 230. And hey, that is all we have. Oh, you got something else? Oh, I just wanted to ask, I mean, as a follower of the Twins, I mean, they were one of the most hard-headed, we're not doing analytics <laughs> clubs. Yeah. Perhaps a decade ago. How has that evolved? Uh, very much so. They Once they made the changes in their front office, they made a concerted effort to go with an analytics-heavy approach. And they took from organizations that have you know valued that in the past in Cleveland and Texas. And I think we're seeing the fruits of that, specifically with their rotation. Uh, and I think that that's why I feel better about it. Because it, you look at the the underlying stats with their pitchers and a lot of them aren't like they are outperforming their skill interactive ERA, but you kind of expect that with the outfield defense being as good as it is. And they're not doing it in a way that seems fluky. And I think that that's why I feel good about it. And I think that they have been valuing the right things. They've been trying to get strikeouts in that pitching staff and they have done so much to my delight. Cause I love a good strikeout, love a good strikeout. Yep. Uh, so it's been, it's been fun to watch that evolution, and I'm excited to see how things turn out. Again, I'm not expecting a World Series, 
But I think that what they've done so far is sustainable, and I do expect it to continue at least to the end of 2019. Well, and so Ed, anything and it else? Must be uh, nice, yeah, it must be nice laughing at the Detroit Tigers as the worst team in the baseball. Uh, as someone who has Nicholas Castellanos on my dynasty team, Ooh. it has not been laughing. It's been crying um, <laughs> because he has no no one around him. I've gotten no runs, no RBIs the entire year, which is another ev- more evidence that season long fantasy baseball is stupid. But you know, right? It well, is how it wait, goes. But as a Twins fan, right? I mean, you know, sticking it. Yeah, sticking yeah. the opponent in division. I, I tend to root for my fantasy teams more than I should. I'll put yeah, it that right. way. <laughs> but stacking the Twins in DFS, that is a different discussion. I've had a lot of fun with that. So we'll, we'll go with that for sure. Uh, and anything big for you over at the Power Rank for this week? Yeah, just looking at college football win totals. Uh, and uh, you can get my college football win totals report. Sign up for my free email newsletter at thepowerrank.com. All righty. And again, uh, you can... Follow Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank. I am at Jim Sonis. One final reminder to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast because when you subscribe, you'll get the po- each podcast right as it's posted. Another one coming up on Thursday morning, chatting with Ed about those college football win totals, which teams he likes for 2019, and we'll dive into, of course, the uh, the Northwestern versus Stanford game coming up, I believe, in September. Right? Yes, it's week one. Oh, so it's August. All right, even better. I think it's August. Yeah. I don't know. Very I soon. I mean, that might be September, but yeah, out, out on the farm, week one. We are a month Stanford's, away. Stanford's the favorite. Uh, I'm not shocked. I will put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that on Thursday. I hope you all tune in then. Thank you all for tuning in for today. Big thank you once again to Edward Egros for joining us and chatting about the, his Heisman bets for 2019. We'll talk to you again on Thursday. This has been Covering the Spread here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. <laughs> <laughs>